Welcome to the DNX Podcast. My name is Sylvia Christman. I am your host. And I'm here today with my friend Derek Weiss, who's the founder of Touchpoint. And I'm super excited that you could make the time to talk to me today. Hi, Jared. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm so excited to be here. I know, I know. I'm really excited to talk about everything that Touchpoint is. And I want to dive right in because I know that myself and everybody listening is super curious about what Touchpoint is and, and what does the business mean to you? Okay. Um, well, Touchpoint... Uh, touch point. I, you know, I started this two years ago. I was getting out of a breakup um, of a four-year relationship, and I was a little brokenhearted and a little lost. And I had a lot of questions about, you know, what to do about love and sex and intimacy. I felt like I had a lot to learn, and so I asked ten friends if they wanted to get together in a living room and have a conversation about love and sex. Uh, I called it a town hall. Uh, and uh, 10 of us got together and we had this very epic conversation about bondage and domination and, and all sorts of interesting things that, quite honestly, I knew nothing about. <laughs> uh, I felt like, you know, for any Harry Potter fans, I felt like the only muggle in the room. I had no, everybody was much more sophisticated than me. Um, but I learned a lot and decided I wanted to do it every month moving forward. And now it's, you know, more than two years later and I've hosted more than 3,000 people in this circle. And every month in New York City on the first Tuesday, a hundred people gather and we talk about something related to love, sex, uh, and identity. And, um, you know, it's changed my life in, in every possible way you can imagine. And so the, the, you know, the, the vision for Touchpoint has evolved. Um, the business of Touchpoint has emerged in some sense, yeah. um, but the mission, the mission of Touchpoint today um, is to uh, cultivate emotional, relational, and sexual intelligence by creating space for people to learn from each other. And so today we do that in a town hall where 100 people get together every month. Uh, this year we started recording the experience. We've released it online as a podcast called Touchpoint True Stories. We currently have 30,000 subscribers to our content online. Um, and, uh, you know, we're also working on a deck of cards that, you know, people can take home and they can, uh, they can have, they can use the cards as a uh, vehicle to have the, a conversation about love and sex with their, you know, the people they choose, whether it's family or friends or a partner or a date or whoever. I recently had a conversation with my dad for the first time about sexuality. Oh, cards. really? Yeah, man. I'm telling you, the, the first time your father looks at you and starts talking about anal play and the clitoris, you, uh, <laughs> You change. You change. <laughs> That's all I can say. So, uh, so you know, it's just it's it's a yeah. it's a wild ride, but it keeps evolving, and and you know, our intentions are pure, and and our hearts are open, and it's been an amazing journey. Yeah, yeah. God, I remember I came maybe to the second or third touch point that you had. Yeah, to, to, to That's right. Home. I remember that. Yeah, and I was really right. blown away by, you know, how how open people were in a room full of strangers about really deeply vulnerable topics that I wasn't expecting. And it just ended up being, and, and to this day, because, you know, I was, I was at the last one here in New York a few weeks ago as well. I just, I, I continue to be impressed in how um, vulnerable people are and how willing they are to share something so deeply intimate in a room full of strangers. And in the beginning, the first one I went to, there were maybe like, 30 people. Now you have about a hundred in there, but somehow that, that carried that, that intimacy that you create in those town halls maintained. Uh, what was your experience of that? Oh my God. I mean, my experience, this has been, you know, the, the, all I do is learn from this experience over and over and over again. I think that, uh, you know, when I, when I started this, this, um, I can say that I, I think that I've always loved like talking to people and more specifically I've loved listening to people and I love creating safety for people to be able to share and open up with me and, and creating these spaces of vulnerability where we can really get to know each other and connect. Um, but creating a space like that for first 10, then 20, then 50, now a hundred people every month has been just a real, it's been a real education in, in, in creating safety and empathy and, and knowing that, you know, intimacy is earned that if we want people to open up to us, we have to, in some sense, deserve it. Right. And, and I think that the way we deserve it is by like really actively listening and constantly reinforcing that 
we are appreciative of what they're sharing. So I would say like the biggest lesson that I've taken away, like that's super tactical from my experience is like, if you, you know, you were at Touchpoint last month, maybe you noticed that every time I ask anybody questions, I always say, do I have permission to ask you more questions? Yeah on that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that to me is like one of the biggest exercises that I've really learned and I have to continue to practice that, that when somebody opens up and shares a thing, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're like, and cool. And now you can ask me anything you want to know about that. Um, however, if you acknowledge that, like, it's a meaningful thing to you that they're sharing it and that you understand it's sensitive, it's like, wow, you know, that, that was such a revelatory experience for me. And I think that that's, you know, in terms of creating a space, a safe space and creating that level of intimacy, I think that, you know, that's probably like the greatest technique that I've learned um, yeah. to keep they say for, for specifically for that group of people, but I still do it. I did it. I did it with my, uh, you know, I was home this weekend. I did it with my, uh, my 11 year old nephew who was talking to me about, uh, you know, a, a, a young, a young girl in his class that he has a little crush on. And I was like, yeah. Do I have permission to ask you more questions about this? And he looked at me and he said, "No." I said, "Oh, great. Okay, <laughs> then we're done here." Um, but you know, but the thing is, but it, but it's such a different experience than just like asking and making somebody feel like they have to answer or they don't know how to answer or they have to lie, you know. And so that permeates deep in a room of a hundred people, yeah. you know. So. Yeah. And I, you know, it, I'm, I'm so glad you're bringing that up because I think that is one of the most important questions anyone can ask. I mean, I know this professionally. I learned that very early on that people that I worked with on a personal development level, I always wanted them to ask me if they had permission because I am, I've never been comfortable with people diving into questions. I wasn't, um, that, that I didn't give them consent to ask. And I know that in my practice, when I work with people, that's the number one thing. If there's no consent, if permission isn't giving, you do not keep digging further because it's up to them to feel safe. And that safe space is created by consent. Yeah. So that's with one person or a hundred, you know, and yeah. I, I just, I'm so impressed how you have honored that idea of creating a safe space because so often that safety is ignored in these in our you know in our time it's very common to create space and everybody shares and overshares and you know consent isn't given and I th I wanted to tell you that too that I thought I always thought that that was the number one thing that I value in my practice the most and I will tell someone very quickly if I wasn't giving consent and I've just watched you so beautifully use that as the one thing that I think. You know, I mean, I'm happy to hear that you think that it contributed to the safety of your space so much because I think it's so important. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the word you, you the the word consent is an interesting one because you know the concept of consensuality from you know from what I've learned is this is that it's a mutual thing, yeah. right? You like two, you know, it's it's two or more people that are entering into a thing, you know, and uh, and they've both agreed. And and the thing that I think is interesting about consent is that you know consent is an ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not just, is this okay? It's, is this still okay? Yeah. Uh, which is a huge nuance because just because somebody acknowledges that they want a thing, you know, uh, we all reserve the right to change our minds at any time. Mm -hmm. And so constantly checking in to know, like, is this still okay? Mm -hmm. Do I still have consent? Mm -hmm. Um, is, is really, it's, uh, you know, there's, I, I would say that consent is probably, you know, in, in, in many ways, probably the, the biggest thing that I've learned around, around creating safety for people. And also for myself, it's not even just making other people feel safe. It's also for me knowing like, oh, I'm a hundred percent sure that I'm allowed to go here. And there's a big difference between a hundred percent and 99%. Yeah. That 1% is a very big gray area. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, that's a that's been a big lesson for me for sure yeah definitely and you know i i was um i was at an event last weekend where you know consent was um very very important and, and what i noticed right away was that i always had to keep checking with people about their consent and also what uh, somebody asked me was like how good at, are you at saying no once you hit a level where you no longer want to consent and I thought, oh, that's so interesting, right? Like to actually ask, it's not that hard. You just ask somebody, how good are you actually at saying no once we, you know, pass a threshold of comfort in this conversation or whatever situation it is that you may no longer consent to, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, totally. That's such totally. an important question to, to ask to also make sure that whoever are you with, when you're going into a vulnerable and intimate space, 
how good are you at saying no? Have you actually done this before? You know, have you had a conversation that would might make you feel deeply vulnerable, where you may not feel safe after you disclose that information? And how can we avoid that? Right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's I mean, that's it. So yeah, it's been a that's probably, you know, in terms of creating the space, that's been probably one of my biggest, most profound learnings. Yeah, 100%. God, yeah, I so relate to that. Have you had somebody come back and say they regretted sharing openly? You know, that I don't have. I don't really have any of that. I think that probably the most popular conversation I have after every single Touchpoint Town Hall, mm-hmm. um, uh, there's always about seven or eight people who approach me afterwards, and they all come up to me and they say the same thing every time. They mm-hmm. say, so I didn't share, but if I had shared, this is what I would have said. And then they tell me a whole story. And so it's interesting, you know, there are a lot of people who who may not feel called to share with the whole group, but very, very frequently people approach me after the event while we're still there. They want to open up to me and share with me what their take is, what their experience is. A lot of those people end up actually submitting stories for for our written pieces on Medium. And, uh, and some of them have even come and then become featured storytellers at the events where they then share that story at a later touch. But I've never had anybody, I've never really had anybody that, uh, that has communicated to me that they, they regretted sharing. I think that, you know, it's usually, I mean, if you've been there, you know, people share, they get a lot of love for sharing. Yeah. And, uh, and usually when people share, they often tell me like they make new friends as a result because all the people come up to them and say, oh my God, thank God you said that <laughs> because that's, yeah. that's how I feel. Right. Yeah. So, you know, which is, which is, you know, part of the whole, that whole cycle of vulnerability, which is we feel shame, you know, we, we get vulnerable, we're met with empathy and now all of a sudden everything is possible. Right. Yeah. So, so I think yeah. that's usually the cycle of, uh, of, uh, experience for most people that end up, you know, sharing a touch point, but you know, you never know. We don't know what goes unsaid, you know? Well, yeah, no, I, I'm not even surprised to hear that. And I think the defining factor in that is that it's done with consent. People share when they feel ready and that the space feels safe, totally. you know, because yeah. when you get people to share in environments that don't feel safe, you do actually get a lot of feedback where people later on feel ashamed, embarrassed, and regret their level of openness. Yeah. Well, we like, don't have those problems at the Touchpoint Town Hall. Exactly. How great is that? Yeah. <laughs> it's good. I think it's my overalls, personally. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, yeah the outfits really do make mm-hmm. a difference. <laughs> People are like, this guy looks like, uh, like the new chic Super Mario Brothers. I, I don't think he's going to do anything uh, yeah. disrespectful. Um, so, yeah. I love that. What, is, uh, what was the biggest, the biggest lesson that you learned from that? Like any story that t- touched you the most? Wow, biggest lesson. Um, I think that I would say that... <sighs> You know, we have talked about, I mean, we've, we've covered, I hate to say we've covered everything because there's always more, uh, but um, I mean, the, the thing that shocks me almost every single time is that no matter where we start, you know, this month, tomorrow, we have our next one, uh, and the theme is oral sex, and last month it was, uh, it was defining the relationship, and we've talked about casual sex, and we've talked about We've talked about polyamory and monogamy and marriage, and we've talked about, you know, masturbation, and we've talked about all of these things. The thing that I would say is my biggest aha that gets reinforced every month is that no matter where we start, we always end on self-love. It doesn't matter. It seems like we could start on something very romantic, something very relational, or we could start on something very erotic or something very sexual. And always we end up on, well, you got to love yourself. That's it. So I think that that's probably my biggest takeaway is that like the conversation about sexuality, you know, when we can, when we can get over the mechanics of it, you know, uh, becomes a vehicle for like universal wisdom about the human experience to emerge, you know, and, uh, and that's it. So I think that like, you know, we, we, we don't have these conversations often because the mechanics involved are triggering like, oh, well, they have that equipment and I have this equipment and they put their mouth where and I don't want to talk about it and we'll just do it. And, you know, sex in and of itself is, is predominantly a very nonverbal act anyway. Um, mm-hmm. But when we talk about it, it's amazing what emerges. Like we start to really understand ourselves and each other at such an un- unbelievably human level. 
um, it's very, uh, it's very, very beautiful. So I think that like, you know, I'd say my biggest takeaway has been, wow, it doesn't matter what we talk about. We're really talking about self-love. Yeah. Has that changed you? Has it changed your, your self-love and your self-love practices? Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm a Kundalini teacher now. Uh, oh, you are? Really? Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. I, I just finished a, uh, uh, well, I'm not done yet. I have one more month, but I, I did pass my practicum. So, so, uh, so there's that, but yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, touch point has, I, I started touch point, you know, just to bring it back. Like I didn't start touch point as a business. I didn't, I didn't have a, a business vision for this. I, 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 I started it as a way of like, really uh, expediting my personal growth in love and sex and relationships and possibly other people's by creating a space for me to just ask people questions and have like a, a real conversation because I felt like I had a real need to learn from others. And so, yeah, I mean, I've had, the, I mean, people come to one and they hear things that change their lives. I've sat in every single one and I've, I've sat with more than 3000 people at this point. So yeah, I mean, everything, I, I would say the way I show up in any moment with any human at every level from, you know, my romantic partner to my best friends, to my family, to perfect strangers on the subway has been affected by touch point. And by, you know, by affected, I mean, just with more love, with more empathy, with more openness, and with more knowledge and tools on how to create the feeling of safety for other people so that they feel like they can just be themselves, mm. you know? And so I think that that's been like probably, you know, learning those things has, has changed every aspect of my life. Here, here. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. It's been amazing. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like we put these conversations off, Sylvia. Like we do, we yeah. put them off even with our romantic partner. Mm -hmm. You know, like like I was saying, sex is is it's a nonverbal thing. You know, most most sexual encounters that we have, they start with a look, they start with a you know a little bat of an eye, they start with a, a gesture, and then maybe somebody leans in for a kiss, and then it goes. It, you know, and, and then things unfold and then consent is assumed. And then, and then a lot, you know, these, these interactions are built on giant assumptions and, and we go a long time without really ever talking about them, yeah. you know? And so creating the space and learning how to talk about it, it's like, oh my God, like when you talk about sex, you talk about everything. You talk about life, you talk about creativity, you talk about self-esteem, you talk about childhood, you talk about, you talk about health, you talk about uh, community. You talk about fear. You talk about insecurity. You talk about everything. There's nothing that goes untouched when you talk about sex, and we skip it entirely because we get triggered by penis and vagina and clitoris and oh my god, like what? And we get triggered by the language, right? And we, right. we 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 skip like we skip the nectar of the conversation, which is oh my god, I'm just like you, right? Right. You know, mm -hmm. and that's why when we see this Me Too movement, you know, just you know, burgeoning over the last 12 months. It's like, that is a direct result of just not being able to talk, not being able to communicate, not being able to really, you know, uh, to, to speak up and openly about what we're feeling and thinking and experiencing, uh, and creating that space. It's, it changes the world. Yeah. It changes the world. You create the space for the people to be themselves and communicate what they're feeling and thinking and you change the world. Yeah. Oh, I could not agree more. God, yes. Thank you so much for saying all of that. It's just so, so important. And it's all about creating the space in which people can be heard and where it feels safe. I know for myself that sometimes, you know, I just say what <laughs> I often just say what I see or what I want, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. I had to learn how to create a space for it, you know, because mm -hmm. otherwise yeah. people feel bulldozed or shocked or surprised and, you know, not really sure what to do with that about it because if there's no space for them to also be seen or heard, it just it gets uncomfortable quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, here we are. We're on your podcast I in know. your safe space. Yeah, exactly. This is my space <laughs> where I can tell you. <laughs> for sure. Thank God. 
I know. Oh my God, this was amazing. Thank you so much. We're at the end of our time. Thank you so much for being here and sharing all of your wisdom. We're going to put below the podcast all the links to your website, to your podcast, and information on how to get in touch with you. Thank you so much, Jared. I can't thank you enough for opening up this conversation for all of us here today. Amazing. Thank you so much for inviting me here, Sylvia. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Before I leave you, I want to invite you into my world. Join us at the DNX Festival in September in Lisbon. If you go to our website and use the promo code PODCAST50, you get an extra 50 euros off your ticket. And subscribe to this channel and leave us a review if you can. We will review these frequently and you can leave us a question that we will answer live online. Until next time.